Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft's roadmap for the coming year is leaked. Are there any surprises? We'll take a look. Also, Nest defends its Nest, its thermostats against Honeywell. And Canon's got a new 4K camera. All that and some quantum leaps coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, April 12th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your iPhones, iPads, Macs, smartphones, and other gadgets from your home or office. Don't just sell it, Gazelle it. Find out how and what your gadget is worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zatar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, try to make some sense of it all. Welcome back to the show to Editor-in-Chief of Mashable.com, Mr. Lance Ulanoff. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for being back. Thanks for staying a little late in the office there for us out on the East Coast. Not a problem. I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> you have a lovely, uh, you have a, a lovely set of pajamas there. <laughs> Thank you. I like I, all of my clothes have collars. These are my pajamas. That's uh, that's amazing. Uh, you, we learn something new about you every time you come on the show. Let's start off uh, with the, the continuing story of the uh, Department of Justice lawsuit against collusion over ebook pricing. Uh, a couple of things to note today. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has advised retailers in that country to raise any concerns related to the local market. This according to the Financial Review. The commission declined to say whether there is an ongoing investigation or not, but obviously they're interested in starting one if they haven't already. Uh, Penguin Group Chairman John Mark Mackinson uh, we had not heard from when we recorded the show yesterday. He has released a similar statement to that of the Macmillan CEO, uh, saying that the Department of Justice complaint contains a number of material misstatements and omissions, which we look forward to having the opportunity to correct in court. Lots of analysis being written today. Depending on where you look, uh, some people think Department of Justice has a great case. Some people saying not so good of a case. Tim Coates, former managing director of WH Smith and Waterstones, those are e uh, those are bookstores in the UK, uh, told the BBC that he thought the US government had a very strong case against Apple. CNET's Declan McCullough uh, had a story up uh, quoting a few academics, for instance, Dominic Armentano, professor emeritus at the University of Hart Hartford, uh, saying that the Department of Justice has a better case against the publishers than they do against Apple. Apparently, he's, he's alleging that Apple wasn't at the meetings yeah, there there was a specific, uh, there was like an Italian restaurant that at least a bunch of uh, representatives from the publishing houses got together uh, to discuss some of this. And you could argue, well, if they were all seen there and then everyone decided to go to an, um, to a, to an agency model soon thereafter, you can say that they colluded because that's obviously what they were talking about. But Apple wasn't there. So, so, I mean, that sounds almost like a joke, really. They all sat around an Italian restaurant and the... the the syndicate got together. Uh, you know, I, I guess I've been saying all along that I, I'm kind of surprised that everybody's like, oh, my God, this is so shocking. But, of course, it's not shocking because everybody knew about it. Uh, Apple wasn't making a secret of any of this. I mean, basically, you know, I, I went back. As soon as I heard this, I went back to the, the Steve Jobs biography and kind of dig, just dug a tiny little bit. I was like, oh, yeah, I did remember reading this, you know, where – Steve Jobs laid out the plan. That this is what we did. It's very simple. And uh, publishers sort of like, yeah, fantastic, because we're getting, you know, this is a nightmare what Amazon is doing to us because we don't want book prices to be that low. Um, I mean, so in, on the one hand, DOJ has a very good case. This definitely happened. Uh, I, I think this is real. Uh, but the question is, so is it were they trying to harm people or were they trying to steer the business in a strategic direction? I think the biggest problem is that Amazon was not at the table. But uh, then when Amazon created its own competitive, competitively challenged pricing structure, it didn't have anybody at the table either. Yeah, I think uh, what a lot of consumers are probably confused about when they hear about this case is they don't understand what the case is about. It's not about setting prices. In fact, it's 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 about 
collusion itself. It's did all of the competitors in the space or a majority of the competitors in the space get together and decide to push prices in one direction? I mean, you don't have to all agree to set books at the same price. We had an email, uh, for instance, from Mike. He says, this lawsuit is stupid. How can you say publishers colluded in changing to a pricing model that allowed them to sell products for whatever they choose? It's not like they decided to set the price of ebooks to $20. They decided, based upon discussions with a merchant, that they preferred being able to set the price of any given title to a value they think is appropriate. And he goes on, you know, to, to make his argument why he thinks open markets are a good thing. But I, as, we were talking about this earlier before the show. It's not about whether they decided to price things differently or not. It's about did they actually get together and decide to push the market in a particular direction. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, with, with basic economics, you could have supply and demand bringing prices up. You go to the gas station, everybody's raising their prices. It's not because everyone's talking to each other saying, hey, you want to raise prices? You want to raise prices? That's all artificial, and that's that's bad for, for a competition. In this case, you have a bunch of, of heads of publishers meeting up together saying, well, the prices are this way because of the current structure. How can we get it higher? And they all worked in concert. And that's where the real issue is. It's not as if, I mean, one of these companies could have done this already. Like maybe maybe Penguin said, you know what? We can't do this with Amazon anymore. We're going to pull all our books from them. We're going to go to Apple, try this agency model and see what happens. That could be very risky because maybe Amazon would react a certain way and say, we're not going to carry your other books. But that's the kind of thing that if, if one person acts on their own, it can be trouble for them, but acting together and talking about it, that's not supposed to be happening. And, and right, at least not in the U.S. unless you're OPEC. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. It gets together and they say, hey, let's raise the price of oil. Let's yeah. lower the price of oil. Uh, you know, it's a problem here in the U.S. And, and I think uh, Tom's absolutely right. You know, that they did, you know, they got together and they said prices are too low. Let's all agree that the prices should be higher. We're going to work together on this, uh, and we're going to work with Apple, and we're going to force Amazon's hands. And Amazon absolutely sort of buckled and said, yeah, okay, we'll uh, have higher prices too because we can't afford not to have these books uh, in, obviously, on our store. And and Amazon is very excited about the idea of, of the agency model going away because then they can uh, change the, the prices, sell books for a cheaper price. And there are a lot of good claims that the prices should be coming down with ebooks and they're not. And so that's indirect evidence of collusion. But Penguin, Macmillan have both said we didn't collude. We didn't meet and decide anything. And so if the Department of Justice can't show that it was a collective action. Just the fact that everybody took the same steps isn't enough to right, prove collusion. It's also interesting that Penguin and Macmillan both said, we didn't do this. We weren't invited to this meal that everyone may have also said. We would have at. loved to have and spaghetti. And it's, it's very well meal. true. I know. There very well may have been collusion on the part of some publishers, but just not all. And that's why they, they can say, no, we're going to fight you in court because we didn't do this. Also, the court system's for. They're going to have to put this out there and find out what's going to happen. And it's going to be public anyway. So if they're going, going to actually go to trial and they're going to have this out there, let's find out what the truth is. Because, I mean, there's a reason why those other companies settled, probably. They're like, yeah, yeah okay, this could be really bad. Let's sell our books this way. We're going to move aside. So it doesn't look good because those, those people settled. But if these other guys are innocent, well, that's why we have the system. Uh, speaking of fighting back, uh, we have a war of words, not yet in court yet, between Nest and Honeywell. Yeah, Honeywell, if you guys remember the uh, thermostat company, is suing Nest, the the darling thermostat company, if you think about it that way, in the, in the tech world right now. That's the company that's uh, led by Tony Fidel, who used to do uh, the iPod for Apple. Well, <laughs> Nest the filed... The darling of temperature control. Well, I don't think... I think that's a fair <laughs> it, thing. It kind of is. I, it's I as dare crazy you as to a, uh, give me yeah, another just, company other than Honeywell just, or Nest. Here we are. Talking here we go. We're talk, I know. When we talk about thermostats the first time, I thought it was odd. <laughs> anyway, Nest filed an answer and also hired an attorney uh, to fight Honeywell. And this attorney uh, probably has some familiarity with patents. He was working with Apple for 10 years and managed their uh, patent portfolio that's Richard Chip Lutton. And uh, Tony Fidel was talking to The Verge, and he says, quote, Honeywell is worse than a patent troll. They're trying to strangle us, and we're not going to allow that to happen. And uh, he goes on to make uh, several other uh, pretty profound statements. Uh, Nest's official answer, by the way, they said, look, we don't use Honeywell's patents. And even if we did use those patents that Honeywell claims we used, they are hopelessly invalid. This is some great language there. They are retreads already invented by others year before. Honeywell arguing, okay, you guys are still, you're using our patents, and you even have Honeywell thermostats in your offices. Smoking gun! Uh, yeah. Nest did... Doesn't everybody, yeah, I know, doesn't everybody yeah. have those thermostats? I, I wonder if Honeywell wanted to patent the shape and the, the, the design. I mean, you know, 
when I looked at the nest the very first time I saw it, you know, of course it reminded me of the the old school Honeywell thermostats, mm-hmm. which are circular and you know, but but everything else is so completely different. I I just get the feeling that Honeywell is upset that they didn't think of this sooner. I mean, nobody's been excited about thermostats in like 50 years, and then Nest comes along, and you know, suddenly it's a gadget that everybody wants to have and talk about. I mean, that's that that's quite an accomplishment. And and Honeywell has only owned this business for for like half a century, uh, and they didn't they didn't do it. So it sounds to me like sour grapes. By the way, Nest did admit they do have Honeywell thermostats, and they are aware of Honeywell's contributions to the thermostat world. So they were looking at them. There's I didn't check shot. our thermostats here to see if we have. We're going to have to. I know we don't have that. Nest, so we, we probably do have Honeywell. Microsoft has leaked. Well, Microsoft didn't leak it. A Microsoft roadmap has been leaked. Mary Jo Foley reporting on ZDNet that Martin Visser, CEO of Mitru, a new SharePoint and mobility startup, recently posted screenshots and tweeted links to a Microsoft roadmap that was handed out to partners in December. Some of the interesting things on the roadmap, uh, IE10 would be out mid-year, so we could be seeing it pretty soon. Uh, Could be around the time that Microsoft delivers the Windows 8 release candidate. Office 15 uh, beta expected mid-year with general availability early 2013. No release to manufacturing noted on this roadmap. I should also point out no Windows roadmap at all. It's only the other products here. Windows Phone, uh, there's a general availability marker somewhere around the latter part of 2012 marked as future investments. Mary Jo Foley, uh, who was on Windows Weekly talking about this early today, thinks it's probably Apollo, which is the next version of Windows Phone, Windows Phone 8. There's also some stuff in there uh, about Visual Script, uh, VS 11, coming release of Microsoft's tool suite would support Windows 8, and that's shown as being released to manufacturing in the latter part of 2012, so that would indicate that Windows 8 should be around out at that part. Microsoft said in a statement, we often provide forward-looking information to our partners and customers under confidentiality agreements with them. This information contains our best estimates and is no way final or definitive. And I think that that's fair. I mean, you, you put these things out and you don't put them out in public because you don't want to be held to them. Uh, but yeah. but interesting stuff in here. Nothing, I, is there anything we really didn't know? I mean, I don't know. I just wish there'd been like a whole new product on there. Something like, what's that? You know, we could all try and guess at it you know microsoft spaceship or something i mean this was the the timing uh, like even the internet explorer 10 timing is 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 to me fairly obvious because you know i'm certain they want to tie that to windows 8 and you know we know that the release candidate is is summer it's got to be a summertime release so you know i i always it it sometimes bothers me that people sit in these meetings and they think oh you know uh, i'm in a meeting where they're telling me this is not for public consumption and i don't really care uh that would really kind of upset me if i were microsoft i was going to say uh mitru is not going to get another roadmap ever again (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's the end of that yeah uh yeah and you're right lance there's there's nothing shocking in here but but sometimes that in itself is interesting because it means okay uh, everything seems to be on track we're not seeing any anything wildly different the only thing that that really caught my eye in there is windows phone if that does end up being apollo by the end of the year uh that that means that microsoft is still in this game and they're still going to keep revving and and not sit on mango for too long it won't yeah and 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 i think that's that's good to hear microsoft is absolutely invested uh i committed to this thing i i think they just understand it's going to be slow incremental gains so you know windows phone will be on the roadmap through this year through next year Uh, i wish i would love to see obviously you know wouldn't it be nice to see xbox on here because uh i think that's one of the big question marks is what they're doing with that consumer platform All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Gazelle. We know you already have, or maybe you want, uh, new gadgets. Maybe that new iPad or or some of those great new Android phones that are coming out. How do you help pay for the upgrade? Well, you sell the old gadgets, and now is a great time to sell your used iPhone, your iPad, your iPod, your Mac, or your smartphone to Gazelle and get some cash to trade up. Go to gazelle.com right now and get the best offer for your devices. Do it today because all gadgets lose value over time. They're not getting any younger. Sitting there in your drawer, and they're certainly not getting any more valuable. Plus, once you put in the quote, Gazelle locks it in. you got 30 days to decide, yeah, I definitely want to I definitely want to send that to them uh, and, and get it in the mail. Mail it for free, too. Gazelle pays for shipping, and you'll get paid fast. You can get paid by check. You can get paid by PayPal. Uh, you can choose an Amazon gift card. 
Gazelle would love to buy your iPhone, your iPad, your iPod, your MacBook, anything you're no longer using in those categories. Great way to get cash to put towards the latest devices. So go check it out. Uh, quotes vary by model. Be sure to enter the correct model and the specs and what condition it's in. Uh, they'll revise your offer higher if your product's actually in better condition than you stated or if they're currently offering a higher price than you were quoted. So you know what? Don't wait around. The gadget's not going to get any more valuable just like when you drive a car off the lot, your gadgets lose value over time. So go to gazelle.com right now to get the best offer. Uh, if you want to know what your gadget's worth, take a minute. Go there, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com to find out. The sooner you do, the more money your gadget will be worth and the more money you get in your pocket for the next one. That's gazelle.com. Don't just sell it, gazelle it. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Facebook now letting you download more information about yourself. That's nice of them. Yeah, isn't it? What do we do to deserve such an honor? Uh, we just were being ourselves. Oh. That's <laughs> all. They have some pressure by some governments going, hey, what are you doing over there? Well, yeah, actually it has to do with Europe. Facebook announced that it has expanded the breadth of its download your information tool. You get to it by going to facebook.com slash download. And don't get confused. It's just going to redirect you to your settings. But it's an easy way to remember how to get there. Uh, and then you click on download a copy of your Facebook data. Since 2010, you've actually been able to get an archive at that link of photos, posts, messages, a list of friends, and if the friends have approved it, their email addresses, as well as chat conversations. Now Facebook adding additional categories of information, including previous names that you've used to log in if you changed your name, friend requests you've made, uh, IP addresses you've logged in from, and this feature is going to roll out gradually to all users, and more categories of information are going to be added over time. Uh, the, it's pretty much assumed that the reason they're doing this is because of European regulators. Remember Max Schrems, a German law student at the University of Vienna, he got uh, the uh, Facebook in trouble by filing a complaint that led to Facebook agreeing with the Irish authorities, because there is a headquarters for Facebook in Ireland, uh, to provide more data to people, or at least provide people a look at more of what Facebook kept about them. Schrem says... Facebook is still not in line with the European data protection law, though. With the changes they made today, Facebook will only offer access to 39 data categories. And he says they're holding at least 84 such data categories about every oh. user. So, I, I don't, this, first of all, I want data portability. And this is not data portability. This is just, you know, a, an archive of some of the stuff that's in there. This is also, right. let's take a friend request I've made as an example. It's funny because I actually went to someone's profile yesterday thinking we were friends and it said friend request sent. I had requested he, him to be my friend however long ago and he just hasn't accepted for whatever reason, but he hasn't said no either. So that's somewhat interesting to me, but I would be more interested in wiping this data off of Facebook. Like sure, I could download it from my files, but that doesn't really help me that much. I'm more interested in being selective about wiping stuff like that out if I don't want it to stay static on the network. You can, I mean, I don't know what you can actually delete from uh, Facebook specifically, but you can obviously clear out, I mean, you would download all this then clear out your account uh but you know facebook now has what 800 million plus users around the world and what percentage of them actually care about this actually care about getting this data you know we have to remember facebook in particular uh is a really a consumer platform there are a lot of squeaky wheels out there that are standing up for the common man and talking about their data and all the, how they should be worried but you talk to the average facebook user they don't care they're just using this thing. And half the time, they're not even thinking about who can see what and, you know, IP addresses of where they've logged in from. They would not in a million years would they care about that. Uh, you know, I think it's it's interesting. Uh, I would hope that if you download this stuff, it's highly organized for the people that care about it. The portability is critical because maybe it's the only place you have these photos and some of these messages that you share between family members. But, you know, it's got to be really easy for average people to use and not filled with stuff that they're not going to understand or ever use again. Well, I ended up downloading my data, and then it said uh, Facebook gave me a message saying I have to wait for an email to say your download is ready, and they made like a sixty gigabyte, a uh, sixty megabyte, excuse me, sixty megabyte file. It's a zip file, and things are organized in, in folders for you. It's pretty simple. It's got your name on it, you have your photos. It's, it's listed in albums. I mean, like I was surprised because I thought it would be a little bit more difficult to go through. Even the HTML stuff, if you just see a quick preview of it, it just looks like a web page, and you can see things. The way it would sort of look like on Facebook it doesn't have the same style sheets. But, I mean, like, if you've wanted to be able to take this and put it somewhere else, you 
really couldn't. Unless, it's not really formatted. No, you could way. upload this, I guess, to your own server and go, this is my version of it. But like, you'd have to come up with your own data structure. It's not, I mean, it's not like you can just, not like the it's data liberation It's for monitoring stuff. what they know about you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the problems is Shrem says, look, when I got my download back when I complained the first time, there were things in there that I had deleted from my Facebook account that were still in there in my archive, which means Facebook had not deleted them. We've, we've covered those kinds of problems before where Facebook has issues deleting things, or especially things like old photos, uh, and, the, and they're always working on that. So it could be useful for that if you've like deleted some embarrassing photo about yourself, but you download your archive and you find out it's still there, you could file a ticket with Facebook, I guess. <laughs> All right, let's move on to a brand new Canon. This is probably uh, one of the first of a wave of announcements to come out of NAB next week. Canon announcing a uh, brand new fancy 4K recording Yeah, device. two of them, actually. Uh, the EOS 1DC is a DSLR camera, which also records 4K video. It's an 18.2 megapixel full-frame sensor. Um, video is captured, 8-bit uh, MJPEG at 24 frames per second. It can also record 1080p at uh, 24 or 60 frames per second if you're tight on space. Um, the ISO is really impressive. It can go up to 25,600 in video mode. Now, that's expected to retail for about 15 grand. Now, the C500 4K Cinema is a straight-up video camera. It's an upgrade from the C300, which was wildly popular, except that a lot of professionals did take issue with the fact that it was only shooting in 1080p video, which is great for web, as we all know. But as we move to more and more professional movies, it wasn't quite right for people who were actually going to be shooting professionally um, all the time. 8.85 megapixel super 35 sensor records at 50 megabits per second video from either 1 to 60 frames per second and can output raw video, although it does need an external recorder for that. There's two raw modes, so 4096 by 2960 and 3840 by 2160, so oh, that's, that's a little a bit lower yeah. of a raw, yeah. Shooting at a higher 120 uh, frames per second rate can only handle 4096 by 1080 resolution, but still, I mean, we're talking amazing video, has dual compact flash slots. Uh, those can only handle 1080p video, so there are some constraints there, but overall, uh, in very, very, very impressive uh, video camera. Now, the, that pricing has not been released yet. In fact, uh, Canon is apparently still working on the C500. However, folks in the know say it should probably be more than the C300. I mean, it's almost definitely going to be more than that because it's such a higher resolution uh, camera. The C300 already goes for 16 grand. So we are looking at some pretty expensive cameras, but then again, for professionals, these are a lot less expensive than some of the video cameras that they've been using for a long time, and certainly in line with something like the RED. Yeah, when you think of uh, it in com comparison to your $700 camcorder that you go buy off the shelf at the Best Buy, yeah, it's incredibly <laughs> expensive. But when you compare it to professional quality uh, stuff like you're talking about that yeah. can be close to millions. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, if you're working in Hollywood, this stuff is an absolute This is steal. incredibly cheap. Yeah. And they are hoping, of course, people who are interested in these models, that there will be more information revealed at NAB, if not the price, a little bit more details on when we can expect to see these cameras. This is this is incredible. I mean, it's I, uh, I'm always sort of fascinated with the Nikon versus Canon argument because they always... It always, Canon is always a little bit ahead, but then Nikon will inch up. And then people who are professional photographers always have good arguments for why Canon might be better than Nikon and vice versa and their sensors and stuff like this. But Canon is clearly positioning itself as a, a professional uh, video camera maker for not just people like you and me, but people who are going to make major motion pictures. It's crazy. When the Red came out, I'm like, wow, this thing became somewhat affordable. It finally did it. And now more and more devices are coming out that are shooting at 4K. I mean, it's, it's that kind of like, I'm thinking maybe like in 10 to 15 years, they're like, oh, your phone has 4K. That's kind of, that's way, way down the line. But like, this is in, this resolution is insane. I mean, people like 3D and everything. But when you see things at a resolution that high, it's just, it's it's almost as if you're seeing 3D because it's everything is so clear. I just, uh, I'm just a video snob. So I love this kind of stuff all the time. Me too. I like to pretend like, you know, I, I wish can I go out and buy these yeah, as I wish soon as I, I know when they're available. Yeah. 10 or 15 years, I can afford But the one. specs are drool worthy. Uh, our dear leader, Leo Laporte, will be at NAB next week uh, covering all this kind of stuff. So, so more to come in, along these lines if Steal you're excited some, about Leo. that. Uh, <laughs> finally, uh, Intel 
in the news today. Yesterday morning, Intel announced 75 Ultrabook models already in development that will include new form factors that are hybrids, like the Yoga that we saw at CES this year, the Lenovo Yoga. Uh, it seems to have caught the fancy of the internet today. People still buzzing around about it. The big headline grabber being that Ultrabooks will reach a starting price of $699 within several months, at least according to Intel. Uh, they want to have it down to that price by back-to-school period, so it'll be competitive with actual tablets that are out there, like the iPad. Meanwhile, CNET reports the first of a series of Ivy Bridge chip announcements expected on April 23rd. Ivy Bridge, also the first Intel chip to employ new 3D transistors and the first to support USB 3.0. Uh, you can bet that Apple's going to probably use this in the MacBook Air. Uh, you can see it in HP, Dell, Sony, Toshiba, Acer, and Asus products coming forward as well. Uh, they're all expected to update and bring out new systems. Intel did say some power-efficient, or told CNET anyway, some power-efficient mobile models may launch a few weeks later than originally expected, but they don't expect widespread Ivy Bridge delays. There had been some rumors about that. So uh, a big wave of powerful new devices coming. Lance, you excited? Yeah, I am excited. You know what I'm really excited about? A touchscreen Ultrabooks. Uh, we got a little bit of a taste of those uh, back in Barcelona when, Windows, when Microsoft rolled out the uh, Windows 8 consumer preview. Uh, and they had a few of those on stage. I mean, I walk around with an Ultrabook right now. I got the uh, the Acer unit. And, um, you know, they're, it's such a great change. You know, I have to say, uh, you know, I went through the whole sort of netbook phase and I watched it happen. And it was really it was really dispiriting because these those products were so low powered. They had smaller screens than ever. They had tight keyboards. It was just it seemed like computing was going in the wrong direction. And I don't think it was helping anyone. Microsoft wasn't happy because Windows XP was being sold. Intel wasn't happy because they weren't making money. Manufacturers weren't making, no one was happy. Um, Ultrabooks are, are going the right direction. They're lighter, thinner, more powerful, uh, adding more and more features, and yet they're going to be $699. This is exactly what we were hoping to see. You know, there will be a big wave. Certainly, you know, you know they talked about it happening before back to school, and they're also queuing these things up, obviously, for the Windows 8 launch, uh, which is very much about touch as well as standard keyboard and mouse functionality. So having uh, a super thin and light computer that still has a, a touch screen on it, it is, for $699, this is great. One of the reasons why the prices were so high was that Intel was not subsidizing the cost. They weren't they weren't discounting their, their chips for these things because Intel wants to make money on the chips, obviously. And one of the things that Intel wanted was some really high construction, some really well-built machines. And one of the reasons these things are going to drop down to 699 is that people are using or manufacturers are using lower quality material. You're going to see much more plastic devices out there. So they're thin, they're light, but they're not as sturdy as they used to be. That's one of the, that's one of the things that will bring the price down. And if Intel actually is bothering to discount its chips, maybe that'll help the price. But, I mean, I would imagine that starting at $699, you'll see, like, the chintziest, like, the stuff we see now for $699 or $499. And they'll probably go up still up to, like, $1,300 uh, $1, to $1,500. Like, that's going to be the best stuff with the amazing touchscreen glass, you know, edge to edge because it's Windows 8. It'll swivel around, all that fancy stuff. Then the yoga costs something like $1,900 U.S., uh, so I mean that's the kind of thing that we're ex like, I'm going to see, but like it's it's tantalizing to see an ultrabook for 700 bucks, but it's going to be the crappiest ultrabook. Well, specs wise, it won't be horrible though. I mean, crappy build. I don't know if I care too much in an ultrabook. Uh, you know, I don't need it to be titanium. I don't need it to be metal. If it's plasticky for 699, that may be fine. Yeah, I I think they're getting smarter too about manufacturing. I mean, we've seen a lot of innovation on the manufacturing side, so. Uh, you know, a company like Acer, which is building, uh, you know, 999 Ultrabooks that uh, look uh, and feel as good as uh, more expensive models, maybe even from Apple. Uh, so they're figuring it out. I think that there'll be subtle things, uh, you know, and, and actually where they'll save money will be on the speed of the CPU. You know, they'll use Core, uh, Core i3 instead of Core i7. Uh, maybe they'll have half the amount of memory. Uh, they'll, maybe they'll they'll use a spinning drive instead of a larger SSD. So there's, there are a bunch of different trade-offs they can make, uh, even on connectivity, I think. So I, I don't know if IS is right here. I don't know that we're going to see really crappy systems just because of history and what they went through. They do not want to get people sort of into that mode. They want them to sort of feel like the experience of computing on these devices is a good one and it's a it's a sort of a high level one that it's not about bargain basement crap 
Either way, I'm looking forward to a nice big selection of devices to choose from. I, I frankly wasn't that impressed by the Ultrabooks, and I wanted to be, that I saw at CES. I mean, the Spectre Envy was pretty nice, but that's top end and it's gimmicky with its all glass and, and everything. I, I, I want to see some really good MacBook Air competitors that are down below $1,000. And the big thing is, even though, like I might say, the build quality might be whatever, but the real thing is these processors can do a lot of a lot more work than any netbook could ever do. And the thing is, they have integrated graphics that are good enough to do a lot of things. So you're going, the quality of computing you're going to get is pretty high class. If they can keep the price low, that's nice too. Let's move on to the news views. Apple just released a Java update aimed at removing the flashback Trojan. If you're on OS X, check your software update for a 66.8 megabyte download of Java for OS X 2012-003. It's about the same size as your Facebook archive. That's about actually. right. Uh, the update disables automatic execution of Java applets. Users can re-enable automatic execution in the Java Preferences application. Google's announced its first quarter financials and revenues were up 24% year on year. Google beat expectations. They've also proposed a new class of stock that will effectively set up a two for one stock split. At closing, a share of Google stock runs at $651.01. And, and after the financial report, shares are up 2% in after hours trading. Android on your wrist? Sure, several companies have tried this and failed. But now it's Sony's turn to try it actually a second time. Today, the company launched its smartwatch that allows you to read your tweets, email, control music, and that kind of stuff. Announced back at CES, the smartwatch works with a bunch of Android phones from companies like Samsung, HTC, and of course Sony. And again, this is the second attempt Sony's tried with the Android companion device. But we're all getting more and more used to wearing watch stuff that are smart and transmit data back to apps so i can see this maybe being a better time than i'm a spot watch fan i would like this to work I've, yeah me too <laughs> uh android phones spot watches not sony's entire corporate strategy uh new ceo kaz harai held a strategy meeting as we expected him to do explaining one sony that's where the company will shed 10,000 employees and will spend 75 billion yen on restructuring. Sony will also focus on emerging markets like Mexico and India. The company will also invest in its core businesses while introducing new OLED and crystal LED displays. Boeing is entering the smartphone business and will introduce an Android-powered smartphone by the end of the year, according to National Defense Magazine. And yes, I'm talking about the same Boeing that handles national defense stuff. The phones will be designed as secure communication devices for the U.S. government, which is actually a sort of bad news for RIM because they need a little bit of bad news since it's currently the U.S. government's BFF for security. But Boeing has no plans to make a concern device, at least not at this time. It'll be, it's complicated pretty soon. Yeah. Amazon's decided to take search and shove it in the cloud. Properties uh, hosted in Amazon's web services will be able to add search via Amazon Cloud Search. The new service allows developers to create a search domain, upload the data they want searchable, and Cloud Search takes care of the rest. A video of an iPad being manufactured at Foxconn's floor is making the rounds today. The video by Rob Schmitz shows iPad motherboard assembly, installation of the motherboard in the housing, and battery installation. The reporter calls the work tedious and boring. He's talking about the Foxconn work, not his own reporting. But there is no <laughs> shortage of willing workers, uh, according to Schmitz. Amenities in the factories include sports facilities. And one of the reasons for those willing workers is that Foxconn pays workers on time. Always a plus. Yeah, to be paid I like you're being paid, to be paid on paid. time. Yeah. The second, <laughs> the second Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that downloading code is not the same as theft. A Goldman Sachs programmer downloaded code. However, he did not violate the National Stolen Property Act because the programmer did not deprive Goldman of its use. The NSPA makes it illegal to steal trade secrets. Bethesda Software is adding Connect functionality to its Xbox version of Skyrim. But no, you won't be pretending to mount your dragon. The Connect specific changes consist mostly of 200 new voice commands, including shouts. The new commands will be available in five languages, English, French, Italian, German, and Spanish. The English version should arrive the week of April 23rd, and the other versions will follow soon after. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Scientists say they've managed to create the world's first working quantum network. Yes. Are you excited, Sarah? Sounds like a quantum leap if I ever heard one. Scott Bakula would be proud. Yes. Uh, a functional analog <laughs> of your home network instead of uh, the, the way we send impulses over wire, though. Individual, individual atoms 
form the network nodes, and information is shuttled back and forth by photons. The photons zip along a 60-meter fiber optic cable bounding between two single atom nodes. So your router is going to get really small. Uh, capable of transmitting, receiving, as well as storing information. It, it uses quantum computing, right? So it's, it's sending qubits, which can be in a one, zero, or both position. Scientists of the Quantum Dynamics Division of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics, or MPQ, in Garshing, Germany, are the guys who put this together. They think the big deal here is that you can actually send large amounts of data over large distances fast. Maybe not instantaneously, but it's not it's a lot not faster about, than anything we've seen. Yeah, it's not oh, about good. bandwidth. And so we can we can take a bunch of 4K video and then we can send it to each other very very quickly. We can network that. It's like in your ooh, that'd be nice. Wouldn't it? But then what'll happen? Well, I just can imagine like the the last fiber to the curb was it the last quantum to the curb. How do you how would you say this? When you're trying to get the, the infrastructure Well, we don't know. We can't, we can't measure uh, both the location and velocity of your connection. Okay. Right? <laughs> I wonder if it cuts down, what if it cuts down the amount of wiring? Like, if, if, if quantum networking can in radically increase bandwidth, you know, across, through one wire, you know, like the way fiber optics could, could you eventually get rid of most of the communication wiring and replace it with you know, quantum wiring that that handles our video, our audio, our data. Uh, you know, I mean, is that is that sort of where this goes, or is it somehow allow us to transport people? I mean, I want to know one or the other. Uh, you know what, John Strickland, who works for uh, Tech Stuff Podcast and How Stuff Works in the chat room, just wrote: the bottlenecks will just shift from the network infrastructure to the computer architecture. So, so. <laughs> It'll help on the network side, but uh, the quantum computers are going to have to catch up as well. It's always the bus. Yeah, it is, right? It's the L2 cache. That's what's going to <laughs> That's what's going to be the problem. All right, let's check the calendar. It was leaked the other day, and now Barnes & Noble has made it official. The Nook Simple Touch with Glow Light, that's the front lit uh, e ink reader, is official, and they're accepting pre-orders today. 139 that's 139 and will be available on May 1st. Samsung is shipping this Galaxy 2 Tab 2 tablets in the U.S. starting on the 22nd, April 22nd. And ICANN was forced to delay the web address deadline to the 20th of April because of a software glitch. Yeah, mm. it was supposed to be today, and now you have till the 20th. So you still have a chance. Top level domain. You still have a chance to apply for Dot Ulanoff. Excellent. Why did I wait? Yeah. I should have done that immediately. Well, it's you're, probably it's, too late. No, no, now it's not too late. You got till the 20th. <laughs> Let's see what's in so Incoming message. Got a call from Alex, our favorite Austrian, one of our favorites. We have many, um, who called in about Google Plus and banners. He's saying banners. I thought he was saying beta when I first listened to it, but check it out. Alex? His thing is not playing. A second link didn't work. Play thing, play. Play uh, thing. It's not on the quantum network. Yeah, yeah. No, it's <laughs> like the play button is just... Yeah, it's not working. Oh, well, no call from Alex then. Mm. Sorry to hear that. Sorry, Alex. That's a bummer. Got an email from Brian who said, My employer, a large multinational corporation, sent out a company-wide email informing everyone that over the coming weeks they would be upgrading the Microsoft on everyone's computers. After some digging, uh, he found out they meant that everyone would be upgraded to Office 2010. But I think he's in response to the, uh, the ongoing conversation about genericism and people referring to things by weird names. Yeah, wasn't Molly saying that it was somebody in her family called everything Microsoft? Yeah. I want Microsoft to open. Microsoft acting weird. But you're not using <laughs> Even Microsoft. Even when they're on a Mac. That's right. Problem with Microsoft. No, you know what I mean. The Microsoft, you know, yeah, it's, that. It's the Microsoft. So, yeah, thing. people have generic I'm names for tech. M. Call it the I want what? the M to open. The M. For Apple. A. I want the A. <laughs> I want the command key to work. <laughs> All right, thanks for thanks for that uh, anecdote, Brian. And, and uh, sorry that we couldn't get uh, Alex's call playing. We'll try to include it tomorrow if we can get it playing. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, thanks to all those who submitted stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Over 5,000 people in there letting us know what they like, what they don't like. Well, 6,000. And Oh, well, almost. 5, so close. 
Uh, yeah, pretty close to 6,000. Awesome. So uh, get in there and join them if you haven't already. It's fun to, to express your opinion about what we should cover, and we look at that every day. Lance Ulanoff, uh, thank you for joining us, of course. You can find his great work at Mashable.com, where he's editor-in-chief. Anything uh, particularly fun coming up? Uh, we just had, you know, it's been a, a really busy day, actually. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the Barnes & Noble uh, Simple Touch with the light, built-in light. You got to look at that. That's on the site right now. You check it out. I tried it out in the dark on a bed. Don't ask. Uh, well, and, uh, I won't ask about that. But did it did it work? You know, was it easy to no, read? No, it worked. It actually, it worked fantastic. Uh, did that, and also um, got a series of interviews with uh, billionaire Elon Musk. Uh, the first one's up today. Share some interesting stuff about SpaceX, and uh, you know, if you stay tuned, there's going to be a video where Elon does something that I don't think he's ever done in any other interview. Well, and that's saying something because the guy's done a lot of things and done a lot of interviews. So I'm intrigued. When's that coming? Uh, soon, hopefully in the next few days. All right. Check it out. Mashable.com. Thanks, Lance. And thank you all for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. And you can give us a call. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Darren Kitchen joins us tomorrow on a Friday. We'll see you then.